uh, this, this first session is to introduce the whole idea of wisdom literature and what it is from a um, biblical standpoint and a Jewish standpoint, um, but also philosophically. What is wisdom literature? Uh, how is it different from the Torah or from the prophets or the writings otherwise, the other writings? Um, and and how, is, how does our tradition really try to absorb it and deal with it? So um, we've all been following, I assume you have, uh, to some degree, the, um, the court cases being filed in the various states about the election. So in one of the cases in Michigan, um, the, um, the GOP filed a case um, and said that they had information and belief. That was the quote, information and belief. And the court said, but there's no proof, right? So in that case, as in many of the others, it was dismissed. So the question is, what is proof? What is, what is actually that which we would call proof? So I'm gonna take you through a couple of definitions <clears throat> of proof of true or truth. And a, a couple of these words, because they're at the key to how we understand what it is that we hold to be wisdom, what we hold to be true and hold for ourselves to be that which we cherish as being true. So proof is evidence that is sufficient to establish a thing as true or to produce belief in its truth. That means, in effect, for something to be proof, you and I have to agree that what we have in front of us is adequate evidence to establish its truth, all right? If you say it's not true and I say it is, then we cannot define it as true, as together. I can define it as true if I hold the evidence to be sufficient. You can define it as true if you hold the evidence to be sufficient. When a court makes a ruling, it's ruling on, does it hold that evidence to be sufficient to qualify as true, proof? So true is what we would say is that which we hold to be real. It's true, right? It's the quality or state of being accurate. It's factually correct. But in order for it to be factually correct, we have to agree on the facts and how they were ascertained, right? Because if we don't, then we can't agree that it's factually correct. Now, all of this seems like it's just pill pull, but it's actually at the core of how we understand the world. Because belief is also truth. It's another form of knowledge. Knowledge is a continuum, and you and I would differ on what puts something as fact and what puts something as belief. Someone can say that my beliefs are proven, and these are the proofs of my belief. And you or I might say, but I don't believe that's proof. I don't hold that your proof is sufficient. So for me, it's not a belief. Everybody with me so far? You wanna say something? Comment at this point? Ultimately, it depends on trust. Do we trust the source? Do we trust the proof? Do we trust the process that brought us that fact? If we trust it, then usually we will trust the evidence. 
right? We talk about science, right? Science is being mentioned all the time in dealing with the pandemic, but science isn't just one thing. Science has evolved and continues to evolve. Science promulgates theories and attempts to prove those theories or test them. And eventually many of those theories get thrown out and new theories take their place. And eventually we arrive at what science may be willing to say is indeed a fact. We saw it with the pandemic, right? At the beginning, science was, was mystified as to what this virus was, how it functioned. They knew what, it, I mean, they knew what it was as a structure, but they didn't know how it functioned. They learned over time by evidence, meaning how did it affect people? And they still, there's much they don't understand about how it works and why it works in one person negatively and in another hardly touches them at all, including families who are living together. That's the process of arriving at, if you will, truth or belief, depending on what part of the spectrum we're in. So I wanna do a little thought experiment. I love, Einstein always did thought experiments and it worked for him. So we'll see if it can work for us. So the question is, how do we know what we know? How do we know what we know, right? It's a core question of philosophy. How do we know what we know or how do we know what we believe? How do we know? Okay, how do we know? So let's imagine a uh, in utero, a developing fetus. What does the fetus know? Or let me say it this way. Whatever it knows, how does it know it? Whatever it knows, how does it know it? As it's developing. That's a question. You can unmute. So I, I would argue that a fetus doesn't know anything because it has no um, cognitive uh, ability to um, to make judgments. So that it is aware, and it, it has the the um, forget what they're called the, uh, the automatic or whatever you know the the the, the um, functions the physical functions. It's aware that it uh, you know that it feels pain presumably and. Um, maybe it's aware that uh, of of needing to to shift in the womb, but, but awareness Andy, is the same is different from knowing. No, no, it isn't. Knowledge, one aspect of knowledge is the knowledge of what hurts. Right? It's it is a, it is instinctive knowledge. Mm -hmm. Knowledge. One of the ways we know things is that we have senses. Right? Oh, yeah. If you want to define it, sure. Yeah. No, well, I, no I, but I that is I thought, knowledge. Was, I thought it had to be cognitive ah. when you were so making uh, judgments. No. Cognitive is only one form I see. of knowledge. And even there, there are questions of what aspect of cognition that we're talking about. But, but even a fetus, as it's developing, has, we believe, sensations at some point in the development. We don't, does the fetus when it's coming through the birth canal, does it feel squished? Does it feel pain when it emerges? Does it feel cold when it hits the air and the delivery room? Does it feel at that moment, these sensations? These are all things it will carry with it throughout its life. That is, you will feel cold, uh, ideally, you're going to feel pain, you're going to feel warmth, you're going to feel uh, satisfaction, you're going to have feelings throughout your life. Well, that infant, as it begins its life, also has knowledge, right? But the knowledge are instincts and senses. But that's a part of how we know what we know. Mm -hmm. How we know what we know is through our senses and our instincts, things that are built into us. 
Okay. Anybody else want to comment on that? Uh, I can't. Um, is there anything I, that's not knowledge? No. Well, okay. You're, you've well, got a pretty broad definition there. Well, is there anything that isn't knowledge? This. Yeah, this is sure. It. Carbon and I, carbon and hydrogen and oxygen are not knowledge. Okay, so substances are not knowledge. I mean, I'm trying to grasp what you mean. You seem to think it's everything. No, I think it's everything that we in that we take in. I think it's everything that we take in is part of how we compose the knowledge that we hold to be true. Part of what I experience in life, when I experience emotional pain, that will color how I see the world, how I take in facts, how I take in what one professor says, as opposed to how another professor says it. That is, as I evolve from infancy into toddlerhood and kindergarten, I'm learning things. Part of it is from the outside, and part of it is what's going on inside of me. And it's that connection, right, between what's going on inside of me and what's going on outside that formulates how I view the world. The, the, in the beginning, I think while it's in the child, in the womb, it's got, I don't think he would call that knowledge. I think it has an innate uh, sense of feeling that, you know, like coming out, uh, this hurts, so they cry and all. But that has just come. But knowledge is learning from that feeling. In other words, I learned that when I get this, when I touch a hot stove, my finger's going to burn. But until I do that, you know, it doesn't, you know, I, I can't say it's a fact or, or it's anything else. I don't know. Wait, and, wait, that's a good example. So when you touch the hot stove, before you did that, you didn't know that the hot stove could burn you. Right. But you touched yeah. it, you knew pain because you've had it before. You had pain before. It. Well, but oh. that's knowledge. Knowledge is knowing something to be true. Yeah, uh, but they ha you had to gain that knowledge somewhere along the line before. Well, you gained the stove, the knowledge of the stove, the pain you gained by something that happened to you yeah. when you were young and felt that pain for the first yeah. time. And right. said, I don't like this. Yeah, that I understand. That's what I was trying to say. Yes, I agree with that. But before, when you first born, Okay, I mean, I, I, you first have to feel the first bit of pain before you have the knowledge of pain. Okay, so the doctor smacks your bottom. That's it, and then you, so you know the next time, I mean, feeling of pain. Well, but what I'm saying- point, is, You have gotten that, that knowledge at that point. Right, I'm saying that it's an evolving process yeah. and it starts with our senses and our instincts and then our experiences, yeah, right. then we have mentors, like teachers, parents, siblings, friends. Then we have, once we have more capacity, books, the computer will input, the phone will input, mm -hmm. social media today will input. All of this is a part of who we become and how we view the world. And it's also why there are people, lots of them, in fact, tens of millions out there, that can view things radically different than I view things. Okay. And, I have a, I, and can hold them as just as true as the things I hold to be true. true. They have evolved there in their life to accept truth with a different set of inputs. Okay. It doesn't make it less true for them. Right. Now, because they and I don't agree on how you determine truth, we don't agree on the proof. Right. 
We okay. cannot agree on that. But it doesn't yeah. mean that what they hold to be true is not necessarily true. For you. Well, no. For them. The reality is, for them, that truth is just as real as it is for me. Now, if you're going to argue there are certain absolute truths in the world, like the world is not flat. The earth is not yeah. flat in the classic sense of understanding it. You don't fall off the end of the earth if you start sailing, right? That's actually provable. And the problem is there are people who have not bothered or been willing to see the proof. And, and they could actually live it. They could actually travel, circumnavigate the world. Mm -hmm. They could travel all the way around. They could prove it to themselves. They haven't done that. Okay. They've accepted- Does that not become- I'm sorry. I was gonna say, I'm sorry. I, but does that not then become a fact? In other words, like the world is round. Does, and we learned that and, we, and that's an actual proven thing. So that becomes a fact at that point. It becomes, first of all, the world is not round. We know that. Well, uh, yeah, well, okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'm, 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 okay. So you know. that's first. Uh, but what we do know about the world, at least what is the generally accepted truth of the world, because generally within the world, we accept the data that has established it. Okay. There are groups of people that have not accepted that data. Right. Okay. All right. Now, here's this is all a way of saying, when we talk about wisdom literature, because wisdom is not about facts, in the sense that the we can prove gravity exists. I can prove it to you because I take a ball and I'll say to you, how many times do I have to drop this ball and watch it go down for you to believe that there is such a thing as gravity? And you can say to me, a million. I can do that, right? Take a long time, but I can do that. And at the end of a million, you have to agree that we have now come to an agreement. Right. There is gravity, and it affects the ball by making it go down, or however gravity is understood eventually. But clearly, something, something happens to the ball that is consistent. right? I can, we can go through that, and we can agree to that. But wisdom literature is not that. Wisdom yeah. literature is not stories. Because I can say to you, did Moses exist? Right. Now you might say, well, I think there's enough proof that Moses existed, but I may not believe that the Exodus story happened in the way that the book of, of Exodus tells it. I may look at, you know, archaeologists and scholars who've studied the literature and say it couldn't have happened that way but something happened. I might hold that, right? Right, but yes. Literature is not about stories. Now, yeah. there is an exception. We're gonna look at Job, but even with Job, it's not really the story as much as it is the idea. Wisdom is about ideas, about how we should live our lives, about what are the things that we accept as being that which instructs us in what is the right way to live. So in, in Jewish tradition, in the, in the biblical tradition, the Tanakh, there are three books, only three books that are considered wisdom literature. There are two more books that didn't make it into the Tanakh that are in the same genre. And we're going to study the three books, Proverbs, Kohelet or Ecclesiastes, and Job, right? Those are the three we're going to look at. Those are considered wisdom literature. Now, from a standpoint of the Tanakh, where does it fall? Where do these books fall? Are they in the Torah? They're in addition to the Torah, the five books. Right. So what's the other section after the Torah? 
Prophets and the writings. Prophets, right? Are they in the prophets? Nope. No, except within in Catholicism, they put the book of Job in the prophets, but we're not dealing with the Catholics here. That's so, no trouble. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the prophets are the middle section, right? That's the Nun of Tanakh. And then we have the third section, which is Ketuvim, or writings. And that's really a library of a number of different books. And our three wisdom books fall into those, that category of Tanakh, the end part of it, okay? Which is the least halachic. From a, from a modern Jewish perspective, which is the rabbinic Jewish perspective, right? We all understand what rabbinic Jewish perspective means. Right? It came out of the rabbinic tradition about 2,000 to 1,500 years ago, the Mishnah, the Talmud, and then the rabbinic tradition that followed, right? Shalot and Chuvot, the codes, all of that halacha. That rabbinic tradition, which comes after it, says that the core, the constitution of the Jewish people is the Torah. That is the prime source. Those five books, that's the prime source. Nothing can disagree with those five books. The next source, which is secondary, are the prophets. They may appear to contradict the Torah, but they cannot do that. The rabbis will reconcile them because the prophets still have to defer to the Torah, right? The third or tertiary piece are the writings. They can't differ from the others, but they can add layers that the Torah doesn't address and the prophets don't address. You, some of, you've all studied Pirkei Avot, haven't you? So Pirkei Avot is a Mishnah. So it's a part of the halachic books, right? The Mishnah, core halachic book. But in it are not halachot. They are statements that are wisdom statements, right? If I am not for myself, who will be for me? It's not a halacha. If I'm for myself alone, what am I? This is from Hillel. And if not now, when? Right? I mean, that's what Pirkei Avot is, is a form of wisdom literature that came out of rabbinic wisdom during the rabbi's period. The three books we're going to look at are before the rabbis. They came, by and large, toward the end of the biblical period, and they are accumulations of wisdom. Now, there were two other books I said, other than those three, but they didn't make it into our Tanakh, our canon, that we call the Hebrew scriptures. One of them is very important. It's called Ben Sirah. And one of the reasons it's very important, among others, is... Um, Parts of Ben Sirah were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And um, we knew it existed because actually Christianity saved a lot of books for us. Because, because early Christianity believed that they were a continuation of the Hebrew tradition, right? So even though the rabbis wanted to cut off Revelation, Christianity did not want to cut it off. Christianity wanted to connect the biblical period to the period of Jesus. And so all those books between the two, which were really written mostly in Greek, not exclusively, but mostly in Greek and Aramaic, they saved those books. And they're now in a book we call the Apocrypha, which is a collection of books that didn't make it into our Tanakh, but are in Christian Bibles, or at least Catholic Bibles, 
and some others, right? So two of those, Ben Sira, uh, and the other called the Wisdom of Solomon, or Ecclesiasticus, instead of Ecclesiastes, it's Ecclesiasticus, uh, it's Wisdom of Solomon. Those two books are in the Apocrypha, but they are also wisdom literature. They're similar to the literature that we're going to look at. And there's a man named Solomon Schechter, who was really the founder of American conservative movement, who was studying at Hebrew College in London. He was reading there. He was what would they call a reader. He was a scholar already. And he was stopped by someone who wanted to show him <clears throat> these fragments that they had found in, um, they, had, they had acquired in Egypt because they had been sold on the black market. And he immediately knew that that was a page from Ben Sira. And he realized immediately that he was seeing pre-rabbinic writing, something that no one had seen in hundreds and hundreds of years, right? He understood that. And that was the beginning of then the, what became the collection of the Dead Sea Scrolls because they had, these Bedouin had found this and they were selling them uh, on the black market in the Middle East, but they didn't know what they were and the people buying them by and large didn't know what they were. But Schechter knew, and they began a process of accumulating them and buying them and advertising for them on different papers. And eventually, you, many, I don't know if you've all seen them, but you go to Israel now, and you can see a wonderful example of the collection of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And now that we have much more technology, they're actually now being able to read some of the scrolls that were illegible before. It's really, as we continue to develop technology, they're able now to actually see things on the parchment that they couldn't see before. So that's Ben Sira, and that's the Wisdom of Solomon. They were probably written originally in Greek, and the rabbis decided they were not holy literature for the Jewish people. You know, the other books, of course, the most famous that are in the Apocrypha. Maccabees. The book of the Ma books of the Maccabees. The only reason we have the stories of the Maccabees is because of the Apocrypha, because the Christians kept them for us, because they identified the Maccabees as being one of the links between the, bi the biblical period and their period, the Christian period. And they wanted that link to be made. And we... I mean, we teach the Maccabees now out of those books, even though they were not part of our canon. So these books, Proverbs and Kohelet, less so with Job. Job is a different kind of animal. We'll get to that. Um, Proverbs and Kohelet, along with other books, were ascribed to King Solomon. Why King Solomon? Because he was wise. <laughs> okay. So now, Craig, we're going to read how wise he was. Right. So I'm, I'm going to just show you how Craig brings this up. The first thing you're going to see is one of the ways we know things is when people that we respect say things that we think are wise. Right? So why don't you scroll up a little slowly? You can see these are some statements of wisdom that people hold to be wise, either because they value the person or they value what's been said. Keep scrolling up, Greg. Sure. Thank you. Keep going. There's, Ab there's Abby, dear Abby. Yeah. There are a lot of people that hold her as being a source of wisdom. And Oprah Winfrey gets in there. So now let's look at King Solomon. Okay. This is from the book of Kings, the first book of Kings, and the fifth chapter of the book of Kings. 
Who would like to read? I'll read. Thanks, Amy. God endowed Solomon with wisdom and discernment in great measure, with understanding as vast as the sands on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the Ketamites and than all the wisdom of the Egyptians. He was the wisest of all men, wiser than Ethan the Ezrahite and Heman, Shalkal, and Darda, the sons of Mahol. His fame spread among all the surrounding nations. Okay. <clears throat> Pretty wise guy, huh? I mean, wiser than the Egyptians, wiser than the Ketamites. And then they name a couple of people that we don't know much about. Ethan the Ezraite and Herman and Chakol and Darda, who either were known back then or there's some code word. The rabbis will try to figure it out, of course. But, but what it's saying is this, is, this is like the wisest man of all time. That's Solomon. And this is in the book of Kings to describe King Solomon. And the tradition was that he was granted by God one wish, right? Whatever he wanted, wealth, power, whatever he wanted. And what he asked for was wisdom. And so it was granted. So what did he do with his wisdom? So, Amy? He composed 3,000 proverbs and his songs numbered 1,005. He discoursed about trees from the cedar in Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the wall. And he discoursed about beasts, birds, creeping things, and fishes. Now, and wait one second. Now, let's look at these areas that he ostensibly had knowledge, wisdom about. So Proverbs, we don't have 3,000 Proverbs from Solomon. And even if we add all the Proverbs that we have, and even if we add the Proverbs of the wisdom of Solomon from the Apocrypha, we don't have 3,000 Proverbs. So either we've lost a lot of his Proverbs, or something else must be going on here, or they're estimating. But why 3,000? So it's a strange kind of number right? Not three, but you know, they use 10,000 a lot. They use, I mean, there are a lot of numbers they use. 3,000 is a little unusual. And look at his number of songs. 1,005? It's pretty specific, wouldn't you say? So somehow, however this got written, unless you believe God wrote it, the writer was obviously praising King Solomon, was using some kind of numbers that made sense to him as a way of exaggerating his knowledge. Now, the next section is about nature, right? We just, no, no, Craig, you were there. Go back a little bit further there. He discoursed about trees, right? Now, this translation is he discoursed about trees. There's another reading of this that he discoursed with trees, <laughs> with beasts and birds and fishes. There are many, there are midrashim about Solomon's ability to talk to the trees and to learn from them, to talk to the animals and to learn from them. See before Dr. Doolittle, that Solomon had the ability, had wisdom enough to learn from all of these inanimate or creatures, inanimate objects like a tree, that he learned the wisdom of trees. After all, trees live, some of them, like the olive trees, they're olive trees that are 2000 years old. Think of what wisdom they would have accumulated if we could talk to trees and they could tell us their wisdom of what they learned or different animals, fishes, what they learned under the, in the ocean, birds flying, what they learned, what they could teach us. So the, the text imagines that Solomon is so wise that beyond just composing things, he actually had the ability 
to learn from everything around, including, right, Marshall, um, what did you say at the beginning that you, we wouldn't learn from? I don't know, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> like rocks. Oh, he, rock. He learned from rocks. Right, right, right. <laughs> All right. So did Mel Brooks. Yes, he did. <laughs> <laughs> don't hit me with that rock. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we talked rock. Right? All right, talked rock. Okay. So now the next section. Now other people here. Amy? Men of all peoples came to hear Solomon's wisdom sent by all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. Okay, so now we also know, now we're gonna to get to the Midrash on it. We also know that he was so wise that word spread and people sent messengers from all different places to learn of his wisdom. Now the rabbis are not satisfied that that's praise enough for the wisdom of Solomon. So they want to do even more. They want to figure this out. So Darda is one of those mysterious names. I only took a little chunk here to look at. <clears throat> so this is Bamidbar Rabba. You know what Bamidbar, does that strike a bell to anybody? Sure. It's Numbers, the book of Numbers, Bamidbar. But Midmar Rabbah is a midrash on the book of Numbers. So here, Darda from the root Dalid Resh Dalid, this is the generation, the door of the desert, which had the knowledge of Dea. Dea is one of those words that means knowledge or wisdom in our tradition. And then the children of Machol are the children of Israel, whom the divine presence forgave. Machal. Mechila, right? That's in our liturgy, is God should mechol, he should forgive us for the deed of the calf. And now it says, moreover, he composed 3,000 proverbs, right? Please scroll up a little. Thank you. Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani said, we have gone over all of the scriptures and have found that Solomon only uttered prophetically close to 800 verses, then what is meant by 3,000? This number teaches that each and every verse that he spoke contains two or three interpretations. Does this sound familiar? Anybody remember in the Haggadah what it does with the 10 plagues? Now, we don't usually read it in the reform movement, but if you go back to a traditional Haggadah, it will each of the plagues was five. And then it will say each was 50. And then it will say each was 500. And it's kind of a midrashic way of expanding the power. So here they're saying 3,000 really means that each of them could be multiplied by different interpretations. So Craig, if you'd raise it a little more. Okay, but the rabbis say each verse has 3,000 proverbs, while each and every proverb has 1,005 interpretations. Right? Hmm. Now, what they're doing, obviously it's hyperbole. I mean, I would say it's hyperbole. I don't know that they would say it's hyperbole, <clears throat> but they are saying that his wisdom was such that you could look at each of these proverbs and you could interpret them in many, many different ways. <clears throat> and in fact, each one of them could be sparked off as a thousand or 3000 other proverbs, that his wisdom was so intense you know, it, it's sort of like you think about a nuclear explosion, right? When we studied the whole splitting of the atom, you know that when one splits, the power of it splits two more, and then four, and then eight, right? And it continues to multiply the splitting until the power is so enormous. 
Well, think of, think of his wisdom as being understood that way. That when he said one thing, it immediately sparked many other things that were also wise, that were also important. I, I had um, um, years and years ago, when I was in Worcester, I'll always remember this. Um, it was, I think my, um, might've been my second year there because when, we, when I was in Worcester at that time, we didn't have a sanctuary big enough for the high holidays. We only could see about a hundred people in the sanctuary. It was a converted garage, actually, a three-car garage that had been converted into this sanctuary, a little chapel, basically. So we would go to the JCC gym the gymnasium and hold high holiday services there, including the basketball courts, uh, the, the basketball nets and the timer clock, which was up there. And you could smell, they had an indoor pool, smell the chlorine wafting throughout the building. And we would set up like 400 chairs. It was a small congregation, 400 chairs. And we would give, we would give services there. And I was giving a sermon. I have no, no memory of what it was. Um, but I was giving a sermon on the high holidays. And after it was over and after services were over, in those days, we remember kissed each other and hugged each other. Remember those days? We used to be able to do that, the old days. And so we were after, and one of my congregants uh, came up to me and said, Rabbi, that was an incredible sermon. I just... I just can't tell you how wonderful that sermon was. He said, he said, in fact, three or four minutes into your sermon, I started composing a song in my head. And by the end of your sermon, I had composed a full song. <laughs> First of all, it had nothing to do with my sermon. <laughs> nothing. He heard nothing of what I said, but he heard a spark that connected with him and sparked in him a totally different truth that he was able to run with. And the rabbi said, they actually used that illusion. It's like two stones coming together and throwing off sparks. That when Torah is understood properly. It's as if you're creating these, they're called nitzitzot, sparks, and they fly out and some of them catch fire. They, they hit the right tinder, right? So a spark hits one person, does nothing. Spark hits another person, does nothing. But one spark creates a whole new song. And one spark reminds someone that they haven't called their brother in six years. And maybe it's time to do that. And one spark maybe says, you know, my, remember my grandfather used to say something like that to me. He, he said something like what the rabbi just said. And those sparks continue to fly around. And that's Torah. And that's wisdom. And what the rabbis are saying here in Bamidbar Rabbah is Solomon was so wise that that's what he created whenever he spoke. He created these sparks that just ignited wisdom, fly, fly, fires in people. And they were able to, to go with them and to hear other messages. Have you ever had that happen? You remember? Can you think of an incident where you, where you heard something and it just sparked something in you? <laughs> With or without marijuana. <laughs> you know, that's another issue. The issue is, and maybe not marijuana as much as shrooms, right. but people that experiment with mushrooms and other hallucinogens. A glass of wine, right. Well, or a glass of wine or, you know, whatever. There are lots of things that change our consciousness 
that make us see things differently. And that goes back to what I started with. It's partly what's inside of us. It, we, are a, we sift everything. We sift it through what we have become over the years. And it either lands or it doesn't. And if it lands, then I accept it as wisdom or truth. And if it doesn't land, then I might reject it. Or I might say, I'm not there yet. I need something more. And it hasn't happened yet. Right? Okay. And, and when we're dealing with wisdom literature, and, and, and we're going to look at this literature, it starts with Proverbs. We're going to start with Proverbs. We're going to do that next week. And then we're going to spend a couple of weeks um, in December on Kohelet. Um, I was only going to do about, a, I was only going to do next week on Proverbs because Proverbs is really, there's no um, cohesive structure to Proverbs. It really is sparks. Uh, so I'm going to pick some different ones that show different aspects of it. And we'll talk about that. Um, Ecclesiastes is a different animal and it's a much more challenging book and difficult book from a Jewish standpoint. Uh, we'll spend those two weeks there. And then in January, we'll, we'll look at Job. And in some ways, Job is the most difficult book, uh, depending on how we look at it. We'll have to, we'll spend two weeks on that. And then we'll kind of wrap up everything for our final meeting in February, assuming that you all stick with me and we actually get through this. Yeah. Uh, I, would, I would suggest that, uh, and um, did you record this, Craig? I did, Rabbi, yes. Good. So we're going to record this. We recorded it. I forgot to tell you that I should have, um, that we recorded it. And so we're going to put it up for anyone that may want to join the class and wants to get some of the introduction and maybe get a, a framework for what I'm going to be doing. Um, and then we're going to, at the very end, we'll look at all of these three books and see if it's, there's something about them that speak to us. I have to tell you that <clears throat> Rabbi Joel loved Kohelet. He taught it many times over the years. It, for some reason, it really spoke to him. And there's much in it, which is interesting because he was, he was not a cynical person. I didn't find him that way. I found him as an optimistic person, but much of Kohelet is cynical about life and about the meaning of how of long-term issues in life. Um, it's much more about immediacy and about, but I mean, we'll look at that, but Rabbi Joel, that was a book that really, that in the pro, and the, and the prophets really spoke to him more than the Torah, which was interesting because for me, the Torah speaks to me of all of the, of all of the, the Tanakh. The Torah really is the one that resonates most with me. But with him, it was the prophets and Kohelet and some of the writings, including the Psalms. Yes, Marty. No, I said we're, I'm listening. I'm, I'm, oh, I thought your hand was up. Oh. No. Rabbi. Uh, uh, I, 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 Amy. I, sorry, I did, just a technical question. I, I had seen the record, yeah, it's still on the recording. Um, so I, I saw that it was recorded, but um, the question is where, I know that I'm not gonna be able to attend every class. So where can we find the recording so we can keep up if we can't attend? Greg? The recordings will be on uh, the TBS YouTube channel. So they'll be labeled as, as wise guys or something? Yes. Okay. I'm also happy to send the link to each recording to all the attendees here tonight. After oh, each great. session, I can gladly send the link. Okay, that would be great. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. you know, I, I, Rabbi, is, there, yes. is there something uh, specific you want us to read for next time? Yeah. Well, the book of Proverbs. I, the, whole, I, the whole thing? Well, or <laughs> peruse through it yeah. and maybe, maybe pick out, you know, pick out half a dozen proverbs that strike you as either 
you know, really off the wall or something that you resonate with, you know, and we'll look at, we'll look at those. Um, and I'll bring some at the beginning that we'll look at, <clears throat> but it's, a big, you know, it, it's a lot of it is about wisdom. They, that language is very important for, for the book of Proverbs. They, the, the wisdom literature talks about the difference between wisdom and folly, uh, foolishness. Uh, okay. You know, the, is, the issue of what is really wisdom and what is foolishness or being, being a fool. Um, and they understand those as, as opposites. Um, it's Chacham and Kasil. You know, it's these two kind of opposite people. <clears throat> you know, it's, um, it's interesting because none of them are excluded from Judaism. Being an ignoramus is not grounds for exclusion from Judaism. From the Jewish people, there are very little, very few things you can do to be expelled from the Jewish people. You know what you can be expelled for? I don't know. I mean, are you thinking of Spinoza? Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. No, but Spinoza was given cherem, which is from the community. You can be expelled from a community, but you can't be expelled from the Jewish people. The, the Talmud says, it's very clear, it's very simple in Hebrew. Yisrael, a Jew, Yisrael, Shechata, who has sinned, Yisrael who is still a Jew. That is, that is the, the bottom line. A Jew who has sinned is still a Jew. They're a sinner. They're a sinning Jew. They're a bad Jew. But really? they're still a Jew. You can't get out. There is no escape <laughs> from a Jewish family. Now, actually, Joni and I were talking about this with some other case. I, I was just going to say, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go on, Joni. Uh, no, I just saw um, the Jewish Film Festival that was on over the weekend for the um, in observance of Kristallnacht. They streamed, um, you know, some films, and there was one of a Catholic priest who discovered that he, um, he had been born to a Jewish family that had given him up as an eight-day-old child after his breach um, to a Polish family to save his life, and now he wanted to become a citizen of Israel. Um, and so it was, it was a very complicated thing. But so does that mean that the only thing that you can be expelled for is if you adopt another religion? No, it only means you can be expelled from the community. Meaning in this case, the community is Israel, the state of Israel, but he is still a Jew. He's just not accepted within the community because they've decided that one of the standards is you must not be an active participant in another religion. That is a community decision. That is not a Jewish decision. See the difference? It, let's say, let's talk about reform. Talk about Beth Shalom. What if someone who was a um, Jew for Jesus joined our congregation and started proselytizing at service, after services at the Oneg. We might say, we don't want you here. That doesn't mean that person is not a Jew. It may just mean we don't want you in our community. We expel you from our community. We have expelled a couple of people, mainly for violence or the threat of violence. We have actually by using the legal standards, we have forbidden certain people to walk onto the grounds of Beth Shalom. We've had a few cases over the years where people felt endangered and there was enough evidence that we decided that was what we needed to do. I'll take it a further steps for your own amusement. In the early days of the temple, Rabbi Kronish, 
um, who was much more willing to do this than I would ever do. He actually, if he got really angry at a congregant for whatever reason, he would actually have that congregant um, have the temple write him his check for the dues and throw him out of the temple. Really? Wow. Give him back the dues. <laughs> now, he only did that a few times, but I mean, it's, I don't have, think we, I have the power, and I don't think the temple has the power really to do that. Yeah. Um, but, but a community, a community can, a community can decide. We have this, these limits. Uh, you know, let's say you're an or in an Orthodox shul, and you're professing to be an atheist publicly, at services. I would, I would think they would not want you there, and they might say, "You're not a part of our community. Get away." Leave. So right? Right. I, I, they can't say you're not a Jew. Rabbi, that springs to mind. Uh, um, I recently moved here from New Jersey, and I, I know you spent a lot of time in New Jersey, so you may know this story. But in the last, I don't know, ten years or so, there was a very prominent rabbi in um, Cherry Hill, I believe, it, which is a, a town uh, across the river from Philadelphia. Uh, who was convicted of murdering his wife. Actually, yes. he hired a hitman. He hired a hitman. That's right. <clears throat> um, yes. and, and he went to jail. And so, needless to say, his community <laughs> rejected him. But once he got to jail, he actually he became um, the sort of go-to uh, rabbi for other Jewish inmates and worked with a, a woman, a, a nun, um, who was ministering or whatever the word is to the, the Catholic inmates. And um, he was taken, was, and I think is, because I believe it's a life sentence, very seriously as a, uh, you know, an imprisoned scholar, you know, as peculiar as that is. But people went, sought him out, you know, from right. his perspective from behind bars and so on. So. so a couple of things. One, I have not spent a lot of time in New Jersey. I have spent some time in New York. So close across the river. Um, secondly, uh, Al, uh, Fran, Alice's wife, is um, was in that congregation, and that was her rabbi. Oh my goodness! Oh, oh really? If you want to <laughs> ask her about, she, she's talked about it before, about growing up in that congregation uh, and that whole thing that that happened there. Um, but the reality is. Um, it's happened in a number of places where a community decides, you know, they they want to expel someone. But what I'm saying is there's a difference between that. If you look at the Catholic Church, this, this uh, cardinal that was defrocked, right? You can be, you, there, there used to be a thing um, in uh, during Nazi Germany, you know, Hitler was baptized as a Catholic. You know, as a baby, he was as a, he was baptized as a ba as a Catholic, um, and you know, Jews when they talked to Catholics, they would they would say, you know, he was born he was baptized a Catholic, and they would say, but he's not a Catholic because we can see that by his actions, right? And the Jew would say, that's nice for you. You get to do that, but I got to stick with Madoff. I, he's there's nothing I. Can <laughs> Epstein is one of us, you know, Stephen Miller is one of us. I can't, I can't kick them out. I may despise what they do or what they say, or, but I, I can't say they're not Jews. Now, some Orthodox will say, you're not a Jew. You're not really a Jew. What they mean by that, they may not even know this. They mean you're not a good Jew. You're not a halachic. You're not halachically acting properly. But they're not, they can't say anything about your lineage. If, you're, if you were born a Jew of a Jewish mother, they have to accept you. Now, they can if you converted, because then you're, you're dealing with the method of conversion. And in the case of Spinoza, it was what he was preaching, what he was teaching. You know, he was basically teaching a form of naturalism, of panentheism, um, which had a God that really was not a relatable God. 
the God of nature or beyond nature. Um, and for them, that put him outside the pale. You know, he, he could not be a part of the Holland community, of the community of Amsterdam, because he went to The Hague and he lived there. He lived with a group of outcast Christians and Jews who were all kind of out of their communities. But they didn't kick him out of Holland. They only kicked him out of the Amsterdam Jewish community. Any other uh, comments or questions? Okay, so uh, we're gonna meet, yes, Marshall, we'll meet next week. No, 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 week. I was just saying goodbye. Yeah. Oh, goodbye. So uh, we'll see you next week, uh, okay. if we can. Okay. And uh, I'll hopefully, Craig, see if, I'm not sure this got out really well. So maybe, because uh, I knew there were people that wanted to take it, maybe it was because of sisterhood, um, but if you would just mention something to Jenny, sure. then maybe they would put out a, something about it. Okay. Yeah, I found it by accident. Yeah, it so easy, I, it wasn't easy to find. And I had to email Craig earlier in the day yeah. because I didn't have a link. Right. So let's see if we can maybe get a little yeah. publicity on it. Because I know there were others that were interested. Yeah, because I, I just checked the calendar just accidentally, you know, to see if anything was on for today, you know, on the side. And your name came up so immediately. Well, I'm glad you found me. <laughs> so am I. All, All right. right. Good night, everybody. Right. Good night, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, everybody. Have a great evening.